everybody and welcome back to Basagan ng Trip, my old show, which I'm now turning into a podcast. And the reason why I'm doing that is because of kind of conjunctures of Philippine politics. I'm recording now as we just heard of the news that the SEC has ordered Rappler to shut down. So, And I don't know what's going to happen, but definitely... I know the folks at Rappler, I know the folks producing the show want to continue and will try their best to continue the great work. As you know, Maria says all the time, um, we need to hold the line. And if this show can contribute to holding the line, that's a, that's a good thing. And obviously, I also we're also recording this um, shortly before the inauguration of our next president. And um, what I want to do is to open the, this podcast with a set of episodes talking about how we got here, kind of historical perspective on the restoration. And uh, to that extent, my first guest is um, Manuel L. Quezon III, or Manolo Quezon. And uh, Manolo needs no introduction. He's a columnist. He's a former undersecretary. And I've been working with him intimately recently on a project called Proyecto Filipino, where we talk about civics. And that's a nonpartisan show. And so I'm glad to have him here at Rappler, where we can be slightly more partisan and have the conversations, have a public conversation that kind of simulates the kind of off-air conversations that Manolo and I have. Thanks for being here, Manolo. Uh, glad, glad to be here. So I want, to, I want to talk about the restoration. In fact, you, you wrote an article after Bongbong was elected called, uh, that said restoration. And I think you periodize restoration differently from other commentators, right? You begin the story a lot earlier than, say, 2016 with Duterte. Where do you begin this story, Manolo? Actually, I begin the story in 1992 um, because there were, there were a couple of things that, that happened um, in that date. The first and most significant was that um, Imelda Marcos ran for president um, and so did Danding Kowanko. And that if the two of them had combined their votes at that time, they would have achieved 28%, which, which would have been enough to have won the presidency six years after uh, the EDSA revolution. Um, it also ties in with the fact that um, that was a year after the family had been allowed to return to the Philippines on condition um, to fulfill a condition of the Swiss government that mm. they, um, ironically, uh, because of human rights, that they should be able to personally face the forfeiture cases against their um, hidden wealth. And so the story begins in 1992 with, in a sense, um, the setting of the battleground that would take place um, over the next 30 or more, or more years, um, in which as um, the, the republic that we had established after EDSA started facing sort of uh, its own internal contradictions, the primary beneficiary each time that this um, government that we set up reached a crisis point was in a sense to reinvest the Marcoses with relevance Mm -hmm. and therefore increasing um, viability. So there's a kind of latency, or rather the pro-Marco sentiment was latent. And I, I have this study, and I, and I recommend everyone who, has access, who can access this study, look for it. It's uh, the Ateneo Social Weather Station's public opinion report from June 1986. So it's kind of like the first political survey you have after Marcos is deposed from power. So a lot of the attitudes here, you can think about them as ito yung parang baseline natin for democratization, yung baseline attitudes pagkatapos natumba yung diktador. And you'll see here that around 69% of Filipinos at this time still perceive Marcos as a brave president even though may 51% who think he was a thief and, there, and, and only 34% disagreeing that he was a thief, although 34% is kind of substantial already if you think about it. Um, so why, why and, and another interesting um, insight from this study is that 
69% of Filipinos in 1986 already wanted Cory Aquino to reach out to Marcos Loyalist. So yung idea of unity, yung idea of reconciliation, ando na nung time na yon, even in 86. So dapat hindi tayo magulat. Why do you think these attitudes were so latent from 86 and then 92? Sabi mo nga, pwede nang manalo. Pwede nang magkaroon ng Marcosian restoration in 92. Well, we have to go back to the snap election. And we cannot, um, we often overlook the fact because of what followed, that the election itself, um, by either standard, by either the Marcos count or the Namprel count, was a close election. Mm. And that therefore, um, the, the, the status quo as of 1986 was, a, was of a divided nation. Mm. Um, what, what EDSA did was thoroughly, in a sense, upset the balance of forces, which were um, in a sense, tied. We forget, for example, that um, when the EDSA revolution started, Cory Aquino was in Cebu because she was beginning a nationwide tour uh, to start a um, civil disobedience campaign. It, it was at that point um, going to be a long drawn out um, battle of attrition because precisely the, the election itself had not really resolved anything. Um, it had cost Marcos his legitimacy because of how um, clumsy they were in a sense about the cheating, but it still uh, left the Marcoses knowing that they still had a strong base of support and, and the other side knew this as well. And yet from parang 92 onwards until siguro mga 2016, may sense yung mga tao na laos yung mga Marcos, um, you know, Sheila Coronel said this in one in her in one of her major lectures. She said that you know the, it, these pro Marcos ideas seemed like fringe ideas. And ako mismo, like height of you know the, the Aquino phenomenon in 2010. Nung una ko nakikita yung mga pro Marcos ads on social uh, pro Marcos memes and videos sa social media. I was thinking about uh, about it a little bit like I thought about the American alt right in the in 2009. You know, marami sila. They're not enough to dent the national narrative. Why do you think people ignored the latency of this narrative until Siguro Mga 2016? Well, it, again, it's um, you have to sort of go to the dynamics of a restoration. And there have been many restorations. My favorite examples, of course, are in France, um, where precisely um, a regime falls, it's disgraced, and therefore it's it becomes uh, disreputable. But as the regime that replaces it faces its own crises, um, what was formerly unthinkable starts becoming uh, possible. Mm. So, so, so um, you I have think to... Parang over to, Overton window, I think in technical mm. terms, the poli mm. side, right? So you have to look at what was happening uh, throughout this period. Um, the 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 to cut a long story short, what was created after EDSA was um, a democracy that may have been very close to what would have been achieved in 1972 if martial law hadn't happened, and if the um, 1971 con convention had actually had a free hand. So it was a, a democracy that, in a sense, had gatekeepers. These gatekeepers were fundamentally the Catholic Church, which could grant or remove sort of um, the mandate of heaven. It was the military, which could um, decide to, to prop up a government or stand back and let it fall. And civil society slash the media slash um, the, the, the sort of... Um, um, uh, symbolic figures like the Aquinos, who also get, could grant legitimacy or 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 take it away from from a government, one by one over thirty years. To, to that, Manolo, I would add the United States, actually. Uh, perhaps okay. Although my my view is that the United States tends to have been more of a bystander in mm -hmm. each of these. But whatever the case, one by one, each of these. Um, gatekeepers sort of fell um, and were not able to have the effect they, they had in the past. Um, 
And at the same time, the, the logical conclusion started becoming that um, as one by one, these, these gatekeepers fell by the wayside, the whole question of um, the legitimacy of who represented, in a sense, the, the malasakit aspect um, shifted. And eventually, after uh, my, my argument is after Mama Sapano, it completely melted away as far as the ability of civil society, the church, and the Aquinos to, 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 to marshal it. And it shifted to um, Rodrigo Duterte. Mm -hmm. It became the incarnation of sort of the, 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 this power to, to say that, you know, I care and I'm mobilizing the people. Um, and riding on this on each stage were the Marcoses. First, a return to to their provinces, to you know, to the Ilocos and to um, Leyte. Then, to eventually to to national office. Um, ironically, by 2010, um, and then and then 20, 2016 was their closest effort that failed. And again in 2019, and so on and so forth. And each way along the way, what was unthinkable started becoming more possible. But at each of these stages, it could have gone either way. Um, the Marcoses were just um, also able to invest money, resources, and, and strategizing into sort of the things that would flip the balance, which is social media, Mm. Um, and all of these things, which no one could have foreseen uh, e even 10 years ago. Pero matibay yung mga domino na yun nabanggit mo. There's a, mm. there's a brilliant book. Um, I don't know if you're familiar. It's called In the Name of Civil Society by really great political scientist who never wrote about the Philippines again. I hope she would. She will. Um, Eva Lotta Hedman. And she makes the argument na merong tinatawag yung dominant block in Philippine mm. politics. Yung yung, um, the church... Uh, kind of reformist middle class mm -hmm. represented by the Aquinas, but she says it's older than that Namfrel movement palang yes. magsay yeah. from, you know, from the fifties, yeah, from the reformist 50s. middle block na yon. And then um, to that, she, she would add the U.S. because she thinks it it's determinative. Like for example, yung magsay say versus Kirino election, obviously kinampihan ng Amerikanos si magsay say. And then eventually, of course, Marcos falls largely because the Americans pull support. From Marcos. Possibly, but by by you know the 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 sort of linchpin point is 2001 because first of all the first taboo dating back to to all of our electoral history was 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 removed, which was um, when they decided to put Estrada behind bars. It broke a taboo that you do not go after a, a, a someone who has fallen. Mm. There was an unwritten rule in among our political families that once you had uh, obtained power, you left the ones who had been ousted alone. Um, otherwise, which is what we saw, then it becomes a really a real battle to, 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 to the death. That was the first taboo to fall. Uh -huh. The second was also in 2001, um, the fact that there was Ed Satres, what's called Ed Satres, an urban insurrection by the poor, frightened the middle class out of, out of the whole people power uh, scenario. And the third was that civil society fractured on the question of, um, of um, Hello Garci uh, uh, a few years later, and the church also fractured. So from a high point in 2001, where even um, in many ways, many of the young people who participated in it did it out of a kind of reverence for EDSA and feeling that this was their EDSA, it quickly shifted by 2006 to the elimination of, of all of these gatekeepers. And um, the, the sort of revival in 2009 with the death of Cory um, was not enough. There were too many forces at play already chipping away because of um, um, what had happened to ERAP. And it started happening to GMA. It started happening to to Enrile. It started happening to too many political forces were going to jail for it to result in anything else but but to take down the system, which happened in in um, 2016. Now, ironically, the person who started that process was Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, yes. who allowed um, Joseph Estrada to go to jail, and then of yes. course. Um, 
parang nagantian siya ng tadhana at siya rin yung napakulong after a while or mm. but you see she had figured it out and and this is i think increasingly over time we will keep returning to her as the linchpin from the person who was in many ways uh, uh, a fusion of the pre-martial law and post edsa system to someone who who figured out that the best way forward for people like her was to abort the system after she saw that civil society could, could not protect her with Edsa Tres. Edsa Tres was the linchpin. It was the military and the traditional political families that saved her bacon. And mm-hmm. therefore, she, she discarded the whole, uh, any pretenses to, to um, maintaining, you know, the, the old sort of um, reformist uh, crowd. And then by 2004, when she ran for election, um, the, the, very frankly, as, as her thinkers like Bobby Tiglau put it, they felt it was in the interest of the nation to steal the election rather than have a uh, poll presidency. And mm-hmm. he's been very candid about it. So, uh, so you say na yung simula talaga ng disillusionment ni GMA with the system was Edsa Tres pa lang. Pero even after Edsa Tres, a lot of kind of Edsa forces were still in the cabinet. Like, and dyan pa rin si Namar. Yes, for, but yun yung, yun yung, but is yun yung hiat, cleavage. Hiat, diba? hmm? Yun yung cleavage. Eh, because yung, and again, because, um, you know, we all see, in a sense, we, we live out ideology through the, through the, through the lens of personality, that the lynch, the, the sort of cleavage was over the question of, of Corey. Mm. Um, because when, when Corey decided after, um, after the Hello Garcia thing erupted to call for uh, GMA's resignation, the pieces were supposed to fall in place. It was supposed to be Corey who represented, in a sense, the, the guardian spirit over, over the democracy with the church and the military. Um, the military and the church chickened out, leaving her exposed. And in the end, um, that's how GMA had engineered it. So in the end, after proving all of that, um, and then the middle class withdrawing after seeing the rioting, um, you couldn't you could never recreate uh, that particular coalition again at least on the streets but that coalition yes. was electorally rejuvenated in 2010 with the election of Noy Noy Aquino I remember Conrad De Quiro saying that it was Edsa masquerading as an election and I'm not entirely sure I agree with that but I see the point I, the point is that this this constituency that used to mass up on the streets is now doing their best to elect Be- the form. Yes, president. because remember the fundamental lesson of Ed Satres was to to close down the streets as an option moving forward. Because when when the middle class, and this is the backbone of of both the church and the civil society, when they saw that actually. The, they are far outnumbered by the by the poor. Then this was not an option that could be opened anymore. So so then that left strictly the electoral um, contest as the vehicle. Yeah, and I dapat talaga balikan yung Edsa Tres because in a way natabunan. I remember at that time, wala mm. namang coverage of Edsa Tres. Like you know, like complaints against the mainstream media, most of them are unfair. But actually, dun sa Edsa Tres, kind of the, the complaints are valid. Like it wasn't covered much by ABS-CBN, wasn't covered much by GMA. Well, because they were being lynched. <laughs> Iglesia they, was covering it. Yes, because they were being lynched. So in many ways, you see the birth of the you see the birth of the of the sort of contending forces that would face off in 2016, uh, 2010, and then uh, win in 2016. Um, again, in if you look if you look at the at, at the at the candidates who were against uh, Noy Noy Aquino in 2010, uh, the the sort of the sort of a common thread among them was they all had antecedents in the KBL. Mm. Yar, Gordon, you know, all of these people. And so it was all different faces of the same constitu- constituency. Mm. The lesson they took away from 2010 was 
if we do not sort of get ourselves together, then the pendulum will swing back and we're, we will be back to square one. And again, um, I think you will see that it was GMA who figured out we better go shopping for a candidate who will change the whole frame of reference of the election. We forget that for all the, the shortcomings and the, the, the great sort of collapse in public standing of Aquino by 2016, up to most of the campaign, the frame of reference was actually still one favorable. By this, I mean, the, the question of the campaign was sino magtutuloy at sino pwedeng uh, magpalawak ng mga na-achieve ni Noy Noy. Hmm. What Maybe Duterte growth. Yes. Uh, yung Remember, so that was what Poe was talking about. That was what Binay was talking about. You, that was the name of the game. What Duterte, everyone was pro-CCT at that time. Tutuloy yes. namin ang CCT. Yes, exactly. But then Duterte came along and, and did what had to be done politically. Changed the whole frame of reference. And they crime in drugs. Mm -hmm. diba? And then this tied into the middle class um, uh, uh, impatience with, with, with reforms and also was able to crystallize the, the anger and disappointment over Noy Noy Aquino, which, divor which sort of divorced the, the, the relationship that his family had achieved since 1983. It single-handedly, kaya ginawang bad word ang Vicente at Dilawan. Mm. That crystallized the the hinanakit, and not just hinanakit, but but the the great sort of anger that many people who had stayed with the Aquinos for a generation felt because of Mama Sapano. Pero alam mo, looking at the data from 2016, and oh, oh nga narrative because it's, it becomes about drugs. Pero may may vestiges pa rin of the oh, old Aquino narrative coming into play. Nabanggit mo nga that everybody wanted to continue elements of the Aquino program. And even yung idea of anti-corruption as being one of the most important things for the electorate. I mean, the top two reasons pala for voters selecting Duterte in 2010 was 20% thought that he was not corrupt and had a clean record. And another 20% thought that they would do something for the country. So Corruption is anti-corruption is still one of the major reasons why people voted for Duterte. Whereas if you look at Marcos, only 8% of Marcos voters voted for him because of anti-corruption. So even in 2016, hindi pa talaga completely natitinag yung kung walang corrupt, walang mahirap narrative. Hindi pa. Hindi pa. Impersonated by Digong. Exactly. Or incarnated rather. But you have to look at at uh, the things that happened, and and here, um, and again, we're looking at a very with a very, very something very close to us. Here, the clincher would have to be the pandemic, mm -hmm. because the pandemic led to such a shock to the system. Um, uh, literally, talagang nakakapit sa patalim lahat, and the only for all its weaknesses, the only institution that was able to deliver was government. Mm -hmm. And the government, you know, under, and, and you know, I remember this is where media in many ways is, is out of touch. Yung and daming nitpicking about, the, about Duterte's um, press conferences. But again, the number one thing that people wanted to see was someone who cared. And he cried and he cursed and he blamed everyone but at the very least it was a it was a it was a bravura performance in showing that at least someone was was uh you know, man hid. Uh, oh and which was the number one effective um uh sort of message that they had been implanting for the past six years about anyone associated with the aquino um era Mm. And um, and I think that that ultimately uh, will reflect in the numbers because yung, yung anti-corruption, good governance narrative, parang baon na baon na siya by the time you get to 2022. As I said, only 8% of voters voted for Marcos because they thought... But, but again, Lelo, we have to, you have to look at the numbers here uh, because again, um, what... what, um, what 
Duterte achieved in 2010 was, in a sense, a middle of the road uh, mandate, 39%. In mm -hmm. other words, you need more or less 39% to become president. But of the three um, post EDSA presidents who got 39%, ERAP, GMA, and Duterte, he got the lowest. In fact, he is the next lowest to the only one who got lower than him was FBR. Mm. So it was by the skin of his teeth, but it was such a well um, handled and in a sense fortunate campaign that you know the, the, the rule of the game under the Fifth Republic or the, the post edsa Republic is very different from all the, the governments that came before. It was never about achieving a majority. It was mm. always about achieving a plural, plurality only slightly larger than the next guy, which is a very different kind of political mass. Huh? So, so that, was, that was when they, they played masterfully. So you, we have to look at how come that what could have been yet another typical post-EDSA election mm -hmm. in 2022, I say if you had looked at the, the surveys leading up to it, any one of the three or four candidates yeah. from, from from Ferdinand Jr. to Sara to Yorme to to, um, the, to Robredo um, could have done it, but no one was sure. Mm. And again, you have to look at the political mass that happened to make it a sure thing, which again was not a sure thing until mm. about October or November. Mm, you, you wrote a column shortly before the election. Sabi mo, dalawa lang ang potential headline or explanation dito. Unang-una, kung manalo sila ni Mali yung Pulse Asia, we reconsider mm. polling. Or number two, this election was decided when GMA created that coalition of families. Yes. And of course, we know that the latter happened. So, so uh, how did you arrive at that kind of prognostication at that point? Yeah, because um, in, in, you know, um, the, the politicians are, are all sort of, operating on on the conventional wisdom yung parang there is there's certain givens but how you can put together a winning uh candidacy in this country and again yun nga because of the way um uh the edsa post edsa government had been set up with a multi-party system with no runoff election Garantisado, halos garantisado na ang mananalo walang mayoria. Yeah. And that there were different math things so, that, that will put so, this together. So I want you to talk about the math. How do you, paano ka nakarating sa 50%? Um, part of this is yung, yung map, yung mapa. You talk about maps all the time when you explain yes. elections. Mm -hmm. so, so can you just talk, explain yeah. to our listeners how, how, the, how the math added up to create that 50, that, that, that majority president, that majority president? Well, yung, yung basic thinking ganito, ang bawat kandidato may baluarte. Usually, kung saan sila galing. Kung Ilocano ka, then it's the so-called solid north and that sort of thing. Um, ngayon, uh, merong mga lugar sa Pilipinas na pwede mong kumbinsihin. At sa mga lugar na ito, ang pinakamahalaga, ang tinatawag na uh, Lingayen to Lucena Corridor, yung bahagi ng Luzon, kasama na rin ang Metro Manila from Lingayen to Lucena, um, which more or less is a third or more of, of the, the votes in the country. Kung, kung makuha mo ito plus yung baluarte mo, chances are meron kang minority hmm. bigger than anyone else's minority. Now, it, you just have to look. The, the, what the Marcos has had were actually a very old-fashioned combination na binuo ni Marcos Sr., which is Ilocano plus Waray. Mm. Akin ang so, Norte kay Imelda, ang Visayas. Oh, so, ibo, palaging given na yon na nasa iyo. And then, merong particular appeal because of social media and that sort of thing. To cut a long story short, you look at 2016, malakas si, si Ferdinand Jr. sa Luzon. And the Warai areas, yun ang kuha niya. But it's still not enough to win the country because nandun pa rin ang Cebu na napakalaki at uh, ang mga Ilonggo areas. 
and Mindanao. All three, by the way, traditionally, and of course, um, um, Picol, kasi baluarte ni Lenny yun. None of these areas are traditionally pro-Marcos because nasaktan mm-hmm. sila nung, nung martial law. So there was still a memory. Um, nung, nung martial law, uh, uh, Cebu and Mindanao were traditionally, alam mo, anti. Ngayon, ang mga Duterte, of course, hawak nila ang Mindanao, Mindanao pride. But we forget that they are ethnic Cebuanos. Mm-hmm. So Bisaya areas, Malakas sila. In fact, the only two families who produce two mayors of Cebu City are the Osmeñas and the Dutertes. Mm-hmm. So that's how strong they are in the at Cebuano ethic. So, mm-hmm. ang, ang, ko, ano, may, may kwento nga yung mga eskribyente noong 19th century na yung pag-uusap sa mga, mga Spaniard who were talking about the Cadiz Constitution. One of those eskribyentes was an Andres Duterte. That, that, that's, how, that's how deep... And, and remember, the president, the president has always been very touchy. He has been always very proud na, alam mo, I am not, I, we are not nobodies. Hmm. We Dutertes are an old political family. He's always been, which goes very much against yung public uh, image niya as a poor man, di ba? Hmm. Who made good, but sa, sa kanya mismo, anyway. They're definitely so, so, an older family than the Makapagals, you know? Yes. Hmm. Oh. So, so um, the Duterte mass is Cebu, and the 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 the, the Bisaya speaking parts of the country plus Mindanao still not enough to 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 totally win but kung ibubuo mo yung dalawa then you have something that brings us back to the political mass of before martial law the old political mass was what you saw with the Marcoses themselves as a family north plus south but in all our elections since 1992, no one had that strength except now. And then that was what GMA, who has a perspective that goes before martial law because of her own father, who remembers and, and is in a sense sort of, um, it's instinctive to her to think in terms of that bigger coalition. And so like she's thinking like a parliamentarian already. No, she's thinking like her, like an old time pre martial law uh, presidential candidate. Mm. Diba? Because for a parliamentary, you know, you, you would just, you, you would, you, you, you know, but this was really poli- family political math. So, Saka yung the, understanding ng, ng uh, ethno-linguistic difference na yes. Jim was always very keen. I mean, she spoke more languages than any contemporary president so she could communicate in Visayan in a way that, for example, Bongbong... I mean, Bongbong doesn't even speak Ilocano, right? Well, but later I would, I would dispute this. I would think that the, this is the secret of GMA. She can speak to the Dutertes and the Marcoses on a couple of levels. First to to uh, Bong Bong and to uh, Sara as the child of a president. And that's a very small club. Mm-hmm. So they are peers in a very small circle of peers. Second of all, she can speak to Duterte and to everyone else on another level, which is as a former president, which is an even smaller club. Yeah, and, and, and that was quite differential to her when he was mayor and she was president, right? Of course, and there, that's always there's still there's always this um, pecking order in our society that pays deference to to your lineage. So so she is an older political family, so that 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 is a deference that even the Marcoses, uh, who are more traditional in this respect, would still defer to. She is a presidential child and therefore someone who can speak the language and address the insecurities of both Bong Bong and Sara. She is a party leader and a former speaker who knows intimately the players in all the different coalitions. And therefore she uniquely, I think, historically could sit down. This is a role that Many people sitting around the table would have played, you know, in the 1980s with the conveners group and that sort of thing. 
uh, in which her father, you know, mm. was one of them. But almost single-handedly in one person, she's the last one who has this sort of institutional memory to get the, the factions together and to remind them what's at stake. That, um, you know, there's the American saying, um, you know, we, we, we can, we, we can uh, stand together or hang separately, diba? And uh, uh, I want to move on now to a kind of another math, and this is the another and, and another kind of bifurcation apart from ethnolinguistic, which is yung mga naniniwala sa reforma at yung mga naniniwala sa lakas disciplina. I, I think in a previous lecture you called the Siga Nation versus what was the other one? <laughs> versus the Tindig Nation. Siga Nation versus Tig Tindig Nation. And uh, itong favorite survey ko from Pulse Asia na kanina ko pa rin na-reference. Um, Kitang-kita mo na difference ng Siga Nation sa Tindig Nation kasi the major reason why people voted for Bongbong Marcos, number one reason was because they believe he has done something, is doing something, can do something. So ito yung active. you know, And uh, kailan may may project into the future. Whereas the number one reason why people voted for Robredo was the same reason people voted for Aquino was because they believed she was not corrupt, she was a clean politician. And, and so what is this bifurcation, this Tindig Nation versus Siga Nation? Well, it starts with an insight from a 2008 uh, lecture by, by, by uh, Randy David, where he pointed out that only about 10% of Filipinos have ever participated in a rally. What, but the overwhelming majority have taken part in civil disobedience. So mm -hmm. his insight was that um, in terms of, of our rights, um, his term was very vivid. We steal our rights. We do not assert them. But that there's a small percentage, a committed percentage, that believes in asserting um, rights. So what this tells you is um, the percentage that believes in rallies, that believes in going out in the streets, that believes in, in civil society and, and all of its um, agenda is, is, is solid. Um, it's committed, but it's a minority. Mm. The, the, the majority has always been those who, who, who believe in, um, you know, um, uh, Romulo put it best, uh, a long time ago when he said the, the, the Filipinos' idea of a president is someone who can decide things for them. Diba? Mm. And um, so um, I, 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 so you, you can, I, 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 I um, contrasted this. You have the number of people who went out for the rather remarkable rallies of Lenny. But when you start isolating the numbers, that's that actually falls into the, about the 10% in every location mm -hmm. where it happened. But at the same time, the, the a party list that did best were two, one supported by the tool force and the other one for motor, motorcycle drivers by an ex-military guy na basically gusto niya binubumbog yung mga police na binabasto sa mga motorcycle drivers. And again, you don't see God, that you forget the whole processing of civil society and rights and diba, all of that stuff. Gusto mo nang siga na magduduro-duro, na bubulpihin ng mga abusado and that sort of thing. And this is, in many ways, this was the Duterte image. It's the tool, it's a bumotsa tool for image. It's the whole idea where Malamang ang tao na gumagawa ng ganong klaseng galaw, hindi masyado malinis, but his heart is in the right place. Mm. And yun na lang yung habol ko. At the, at, the peak of, at the peak of Rafi Tulfo show, yung Wanted sa Radyo, that was also the peak of Duterte's show sa Davao. Mm. Na pareho yung format na magsusumbong mm. sila doon kay Mayor or kay Idol Rafi. So yung gagawin ni Mayor Idol Rafi, tatawagan niya yung, 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 yung nag-agrabyado doon sa mm. citizen. Sawaay niya on air, and yung perception don is is matapang action agad, and and that's why you know I think the surveys cons cons uh, consistently showed that the adjective people used to describe Duterte the most was matapang. Yeah. And that's also the adjective people used to describe Ferdinand Marcos Senior, matapang. 
And uh, important yun, that's that's part of yung notion of charisma because yung 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 tapang that is circumscribed by a good heart or malasakit that is i think the core of what filipino people think is charisma kaya nga napaka-effective dun tagline ni Duterte tapang at malasakit yes exactly exactly and i was telling people uh, especially some media they were all focused on the violent side of of Duterte but i said that actually the core of it is that he is he has come to incarnate and monopolize the idea of caring This was something that the, the Aquinos had for a generation. But uh, uh, Duterte was able to, to take it. And now I think he holds it. And he will hold it for... So know. what is the discourse of malasakit that's being promoted naman by the Marcoses? If you think Duterte holds a kind of monopoly over what malasakit is now? Um, b- there it's the, que- the element of may nagawa. Um, nakawawa mm. nakawawa din ng mga Marcos because the, because there it's it's part and parcel of the whole idea na if if we were deceived or we we were let down by the whole middle yellow discourse for 30 years then everything we thought was bad must be good mm. because everything that we thought was good we now consider bad and this is the heart of of This is the heart of any restoration. That 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 turning of the wheel. The mundo. Yes, um, it's a real revolution. Mm. The same way that a revolution first ousted them, and that's the whole idea of a revolution. Mm. So so um, so the Marcoses have this kind of karmic, um, uh, you know, rebirth, and at the same time, it's borrowed charisma. Mm. I mean, I was telling borrowed people from Nigong. Borrowed, so borrowed, from Sarah, borrowed from Apolakai. Borrowed from Sarah. Uh-huh. Because, because, because again, um, in many ways, the interesting element here was we know that that um, the president did not want be Bong Bong to be his successor. Mm. He had his own idea. The problem was his own idea, um, his own candidate never took off. Mm. Go. And oddly enough, in a very strange thing, and again, this this has to be. Um, unpacked, um, people sort of decided for the president that his his political heir was his daughter. Mm. They decided it for him and invested it in her. And she has her own political gift so that if you look at the campaign, the one who had that instinct for the to, to hug, to mm. touch, to, you know, to magbigay ng lambing or whatever, was Sarah. Yeah, naalala ko nag-post ka ng video na mm. may matanda nagpapayakap. Si mm. Marcos para nandidire. Oo, oh, oo. Oh, 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 kita, kita mo. Yung katawan. And then oh. Sarah comes in for a big bear hug. Yes. And the woman is almost crying as Sarah comes in for that bear hug. Yes. It's, a, it's kind of natural charisma. It is. And that is very powerful. And so she holds that. Then that's borrowed. So the, the Marcos says, have it because in a sense, The what demolished the historical sort of barriers in the Cebuano area and in Mindanao was the idea if the Dutertes are okay with it, then it must be okay. It must be that yung lahat ng sama ng loob or yung misgivings natin for a generation. Bali, wala. Kasi sabi, sabi ni Tatay eh. Sabi ni mm-hmm. Sara, di ba? Sabi ni Inday. So, mm-hmm. um, and that is the, 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 the sort of wariness that is going to be there moving forward because it is borrowed charisma. Yeah, so so we're talking about the future now. I, I, the other thing you've been saying is that in a way, dahil panalo na yung mga Marcos, absuelto na sila. So they yes. won the past. Yes, I think this now is... Now they one, have to contend is, with the future. Yes, but this is one thing. Um, in, there is something in our political culture, both on the part of candidates and the voters, that understands election to be absolution. Um, even though the the Supreme Court has said that's no longer the case, but nasa kultura natin yun. So in that sense, tapos na ang, ang 1986 to onwards. The problem is now that there is a new mandate and a powerful mandate, then there is uh, no one to blame anymore. In other words, 
how the future the future unfolds is completely on the shoulders of of Marcos. Kaya po pasok sa eksena si Juan Ponce Enrile and others na ginagatungan yung kapraningan ni ni uh, incoming president Bongbong Marcos by saying hindi, marami mga nakapaligid sa iyo na nagpa-plot na alam mo, they have to feed that thing, they have to try to keep alive the idea na um, which is why Vic Rodriguez, the, the incoming um, uh, executive secretary, is saying uh, also, you know, expectations are too high. We have to dial down expectations because there are many uh, problems. Okay, so what you're saying, what are you saying? Are you saying uh, the future is uh, kind of rocky for the incoming president because of a perception that someone is going to stab him in the back or because you really think somebody's going to stab him in the back? Well, I, 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 I calculated it this way. Um, they have spent 30 years to get to this point of restoration. And then what happens? Is it going to be a big anticlimax? Because what? Then you have your regular six years. Tapos, he goes into retirement and he becomes an ex-president after all this hype and all these things. Um, the six years is probably not enough to untangle all of the problems that were hounding them for the past 30 years, such as cases. Um, is it even enough to fully um, implant your rehabilitation and vindication? Will and destroy you, a lot of the EDSA institutions that you saw. That destroy. still remain, right? Mm -hmm. There was one blogger who said that the, the sort of uh, catch-22 here is that uh, the Marcos restoration will require uh, his taking an oath to a, to a constitution built on the ruins of his father's. Um, oh, that's beautiful. And I, but I said that may be so, but that never prevented them from taking the oath as officials during the past 30 years anyway. So that's, right. that's beside the point. But this is the question. From the point of view of the Duterte. A Marco sandwich is fine because you would have six years of senior, six years of Marcos Jr., and then six years of Sara for 18 years, which is one of the longest stretches of, um, of a, a single coalition in our history, but dominated by them. Mm. So panalo sila, di ba? And, and, um, and, if, and so you can imagine that the, the intense paranoia on the part of both of these families, because the logical conclusion for anyone, for the Marcos, is, is there has to be a, a sixth republic. Mm -hmm. There has to be a new republic that 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 puts an end to the to this this existing republic and m enshrines their vision, whatever it turns out to be, um, of the Philippines. This is not necessarily one shared by the Dutertes because there is, you know. The moment you become vice president, your yung yung parang political freshness mo ano yun, mawawala eh. mm -hmm. And unless um she can be really sure of of becoming the heir by by the midterm, yayari na siya. Eh. I mean that's just the way things are. Mm -hmm. So, so you see, yeah, you're saying that <laughs> it's possible that the final revenge of Corazon at Kuwanko Aquino is mahirap matinag yung constitution niya. Um, ironically, yes, because the, the whole reason, I mean, it's a double-edged uh, irony because one, my belief is one of the reasons we are where we are with the Marcos Restoration was impossible amiendahan ang Cori Constitution because of the defective way it was written. Because of this, it just makes every alternative more extreme. Mm. Diba? Kasi walang mapuntahan eh. I, a system that cannot revise itself is a dead system. Mm -hmm. Alam mo? And everyone has been scratching their head. Paano ba natin, I mean, just to improve it or anything, impossible. Mm. So, so we kept on going for 20 years. It was military. Uh, the other way was, was parliamentary, whatever. So you finally have a president. Marcos Jr., who may have the political capital to finally break the impasse, diba? but um, will he? 
And if he does, what do the Dutertes have to say about this? Um, yeah, so that would be the irony. The irony is that the same thing that destroyed the Aquinos, maybe the same thing that redestroys the Marcoses. So we're 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 closing in on time, but um, mm -hmm. and I and I hate prognostication because you always get it wrong. But if there's a person, but there's if there's a person who can act as a political Nostradamus, it's you. Um, would you care to prognosticate? You can be as vague or as specific as you want about the future. No, I think you have to look at at um, horizons. Um, the, the window of opportunity for a president to, to accomplish anything major is possible probably within the first half of their term, by the midterm. Because by the midterm, they will be judged, and this is, this is over all our presidencies, they will be judged and either they will be weakened after the midterm or emboldened. But at the same time, there's a kind of, um, um, because of the system, there's a, there's a inbuilt sort of self-destructive mechanism. After six years, all the parties dissolve and recombine. Marcos has to, in a sense, redo the whole system within the next three years. And that way he can knock out the Dutertes, stand on his own, and most of all, create a new system that in a sense, they can either continue to dominate or will leave them all safe. The present mm -hmm. system will not do that. Mm -hmm. um, so if he's unable to do it within the first coming three years, um, the chances are that he will be able to do it at all becomes less and less, which means you have a chance for a Duterte restoration. I do think the dominant sort of ideology is not Marcos. It will remain that wonderfully vague thing of, of, of Duterte style Thing, especially because it's being retooled by the daughter. And Manolo the person Kesson. to watch will be GMA. And with that, Manolo Kesson, thank you very much for joining us in, in the reboot of Basaganang Clip. Thank you.